right, I'm going to be honest with you. We're going to have to do the top 10 stories in more detail next Monday when we're back here uh, because the crew, as usual, has overdone it and put so many graphics and so many news articles and so many documents in there that it made the computer crash. Because we've got some tinker toy made on the moon, but uh, the, the computer we've got. But no, no, seriously, great job to the crew. Great job to do, who's been on vacation and has a new nickname, the director. Uh, all right, it's InfoWars Nightly News, screwing around a bit. It is the final transmission. I might do a few YouTube rants or something uh, over the weekend, but it is the final transmission of 2011. What an incredibly eventful year. And no, I'm not going to cover tonight MSNBC demonizing myself and Ron Paul last night or the fact that uh, our operation has been in more than 500 mainstream, that means zombie controlling, prostitute, New World Order, dinosaur, whore media uh, in the last two weeks, and that we're absolutely devastating the globalist. I'm not going to get into that today, though I just did in a way. I'm not going to cover as our top 10 stories, um, even though in many newspapers, the Charlie Sheen story that broke on my show earlier in the year inadvertently is one of the top entertainment stories, if not the number one entertainment stories uh, of the year. We're not going to get into all of that because that's not what we do here. We're about the hardcore intel, the analysis. We're obsessed with reality. And so we do have uh, these top 10 points. And, and you can argue what story is more important or what story is less important. Quite frankly, I think the buildup to Iran and a huge war that runs from bad to worse. And Ray McGovern, former top CIA analyst, is going to be joining us via video Skype here in a few minutes to break that down. You can debate. Uh, whether Fukushima is a bigger story or whether the buildup to war with Iran is a bigger story. But Iran hasn't happened yet, so I think it does deserve uh, to be uh, basically uh, where it is on our top 10 list here. But you can certainly debate uh, the uh, placement of these bad boys. So let me go ahead and just start with number 10, building towards the most important story uh, of the year here at InfoWars at Nightly News. By the way, we've been doing the show now, what, four or five months? September 1st was our launch, and we are about to go into the second year of the transmission here at InfoWars Nightly News. You can see the logo there may turn into Megatron any minute. All right, uh, you wanna hear a Starscream imitation? Or I did one of those on the radio today. Uh, Megatron, I will be the leader. <laughs> All right, uh, continuing here. All right, it's, it's, it's the end of the year. We're plunging into nightmarish 2012. It's gallows humor. If you're publicly educated like I was, you may not know what gallows humor is if you're a new viewer out there, not one of our savvy subscribers, but you're about to be hung. The other guys are lined up being hung in front of you. A lot of people are known to not break down and cry and beg for mommy. You make a smart ass joke. That's kind of what we're doing here. Okay, I apologize. I'm going to stop right there. See, something happens like a time warp. I'm in a hurry to get out of here. My wife's going out with her friends tonight. I'm going to babysit, and uh, I'm already supposed to be home. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and do like a two-hour show here. And her and her friends can all wait at the house. <laughs> These are called lame attempts at humor. She's going to love that part of the broadcast tonight. All right. I'll be home after New Year's, honey. You can go out the day after. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, all right. Uh, number 10, Occupy Movement. Fed uh, Reserve Occupy Movement was our event to basically counter the George Soros attempt to take control of any protest against what corrupt elements of Wall Street are doing. They wanted to make it about a wealth transference issue instead of debating how the big mega banks are shutting down the free market and using government to create crony capitalist monopolies uh, and basically shut down their competition. We're all for people creating a widget or a book or a new musical instrument making a billion bucks. That's what makes the world go around. And that's what uh, honors individual creativity. 
But this idea that our problems have been caused because of the free market and private property, no, we're getting away from the free market and private property and the Bill of Rights and Constitution. That's the oxygen being sucked out of the room. So number 10 is uh, the establishment knowing that revolution was coming, that revolution was calling, as the Queen, Queen's Reich song says, revolution calling, revolution calling. They knew that that was happening, so they tried to basically trigger it preemptively, like Red Adair blowing up a oil well on fire with a stick of dynamite, but it didn't work, so now they're trying to clean that experiment off the street. Al Gore, of course, called for their own Arab Spring here in America, and it failed. That's their attempt to steer public anger into giving the globalists more power, and it failed. Doesn't mean the individual Occupy people are bad, but the overall control and the spin and what the dinosaur whore media labeled it as, that is a fraud. Number nine, Al-Qaeda NATO alliance. NATO helping the Al-Qaeda rebels. Rebels are Al-Qaeda led, and now they're exporting it on to Syria. We reported with Webster Tarpley and other valiant uh, investigative journalists, while it was under bombardment, two months into the six month peace bomb attack, the birth of the peace bomb. This is not a military action, we're just bombing all your cities. Now that the uh, uh, Arab fighters brought in out of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Afghanistan, well, that's Central Asian folks, not really Arab, but the point is uh, uh, they're in Afghanistan with the Arab fighters, were slaughtering black people all over Libya uh, because it was known that they tended to side with Gaddafi. And, and since then, the BBC and many others have admitted, okay, they've probably killed 40,000 black people. But you know what? It's liberal because Obama did it and NATO did it. So hacking up black folks with machetes and shooting little kids in the head or, I mean, that's, that's, that's liberal. Now, if you had tens of thousands of newsletters and nine lines of, you know, semi kind of right wing bigoted statements, well, then you can't be elected president like Ron Paul. But if you're, who actually fought against hacking up black people with machetes because he's racist. So uh, there you go. Um, that's all been proven uh, accurate there now uh, that our reporters first told us here on this show from Syria. But hey, being right's a bad thing in the uh, modern age of insanity. What did George Orwell say? In a world of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Moving on along from Al-Qaeda, who's always worked for the big banks and the CIA, uh, let's go to number eight, Ron Paul surging uh, and not just Iowa to number one, but in other states, uh, despite the out of control attacks that I already mentioned. And one reason the system is so scared of Ron Paul is in major national polls, he is the number one Republican amongst quote minorities, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and others. And so that's why the system is going after him because they need the Republicans and Democrats to continue this whole racial divide and conquer where they play everybody off against each other while all offshore banks rob the living daylights out of us through their control of the taxation system that's paid to them in banker bailouts. The Democratic Party, the Republican Party, Mitt Romney has said it's his mission to defeat Ron Paul. I thought he was somebody that couldn't win. I thought he was somebody you ignored and gave 89 seconds in the CBS debate. But now the American people want Ron Paul, so they're saying, well, you're kooks, you're dangerous. Uh, you, you know, they're saying his supporters are cult members. So the corrupt establishment is saying, we're cult members because we want Ron Paul, because the majority wants Ron Paul. And, and, and so now they're trying to say, well, if you let him win the Iowa caucuses, it discredits the caucus system. So now our electoral process is discredited if we elect Ron Paul. And it's those trying to discredit the electoral process who are then blaming those of us who haven't discredited it for what's happened. They say it will discredit it, the governor uh, of Iowa and others, when they're the ones trying to discredit it. Amazing. But now the Republican leadership has said, because of hacker threats, they'll have to count the caucus ballots. It's known he would win because it's the only fair vote in the country where it's hands being raised in each precinct and written down, and then you just tally them publicly in the state. But now that will be secretive, the Republicans have said, and it will be sent to a secret location, and no one is allowed to see it to keep us safe from hackers, a.k.a. boogeymen, a.k.a. al-Qaeda.
Uh, so clearly they're getting ready to try to steal Iowa because they know he's turbo surging and it's just more fraud. So some would say, well, then why do we even try? Because by resisting, we educate people. By resisting, we show the fraud. By resisting, more people learn the truth about the new world order. As Ron Paul will tell you, great patriot and historian and doctor and economist, he is only a focal point for revolution against tyranny, a restoration of the republic. And by fighting, we get stronger. You know, the first time I went and lifted weights, I couldn't bench press 340 pounds. But after five, six years of lifting weights, I could do it. The first time I tried to jog, I could only run a mile. You know, now I can run eight miles, even though I'm a lard butt, as, as people well know. It, 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 it takes a process of working out mentally, physically, spiritually on any issue. Playing an instrument, you pick up a, a guitar the first time, or a piano. Uh, you can't play it, but you learn to play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Next, you're playing Strauss, Beethoven, and uh, other classics. Okay, continuing away from Ron Paul, I, I didn't cover all the points. It's just that he shows that the, the resistance is rising and that uh, the dinosaur dying media that's not mainstream media, that is fraud, globalist, corporate propaganda media, is dying. They tried to defeat Rand Paul by saying he kidnapped women, worshipped Buddhas, every other bizarre form you can imagine. They hired people to dress up as hayseeds and have racist signs. They got caught. Now, that remains to be seen nationally what will happen with Ron Paul, but we're definitely in the fight. This is a big deal that's happening right now, and it's only uh, foreshadowing of things to come. Let's move on now to number seven, FEMA camp activation. Does that mean they're going to throw us all in them tomorrow? No, but it means they're actually putting the bids out, as we showed you earlier in the year, just a few weeks ago, actually, that the government is putting out public bids to now man the emergency centers that they've built at former military bases across the country, and the FEMA camps are admitted, and the NDAA is passed, and they admit they're going to put troops on the streets, and it's all happening. And it just shows you that the criminal class that's robbed tens of trillions of dollars and thinks the American people are going to be signed on to all the derivatives fraud, uh, it shows that they're scared. And we're going to be talking uh, with Ray McGovern about that here in just a moment. In fact, speaking of Ray McGovern, that takes us now from number seven, FEMA camp activation, to number six, Iran war buildup, fake plot with used car salesmen out of Corpus Christi, Texas, drills in the Strait of Hormuz, a drone shoot down U.S. ships trying to provoke attacks and more. Ron Paul a few weeks ago was on my radio show, and uh, again, the system's trying to dictate reality and saying Ron Paul shouldn't go on that show because it's so extreme. No, because we're so extremely accurate and teleprompter free and hardcore about freedom. They hate the fact that he has so much credibility and he's linking up with us over 16 years and that that gives us more credibility and then we give him more credibility and it creates this grassroots synergy of saying, hey, Chris Matthews, all of you, you're a bunch of jokes, little degenerate, lying, teleprompter reading scumbags who think you sit up there in this air of respectability and authority. Last night on, hard, on, on uh, Slimeball, uh, Chris Slimeball Matthews was saying to these little twitly reporters he had on, little establishment bloggers, well, is it credible that Ron Paul is, is, is saying this whole uh, Iranian assassination plot in the U.S. of the, uh, of the Saudi ambassador is bull? Is that credible? And, and the uh, lazy-eyed woman they had on there, I mean, she looked like my dogs have more life in their eyes than her. I mean, a thousand times. This dead-eyed woman, this one-way eyes, you know, there's nothing behind them. It's just one way like doll eyes. Her eyes were unfocused and looking around like she was having a seizure or something. Uh, she's, or, or having a stroke. I mean, I actually feel sorry for her talking about her now, but I have to discuss it. He looks to her as this appeal to authority. And if we had time out, we'd play the clip, play it on the radio. And she's sitting there all, uh, like a little rag. Uh. She's like, uh. Can't really focus. And he goes, is it credible that Ron Paul says that this Iran threat wasn't credible. She's like, I guess not. I'm good. Uh, I mean, her hair is disheveled. She's like in some clown suit. I mean, she looks like an amoeba is powering her brain or something. They got an amoeba on a treadmill powering her brain. I'm not trying to be mean. And, and, and here is Chris Matthews. Is this credible? Uh, 
and then and then she says it's not credible. So you're supposed to go, oh well. Uh, Someone who has an IQ around room temperature uh, is telling me that it's not credible, so it must be. Think for yourself. Don't believe me. Don't believe them. Look into it. Please. Holy mackerel. I mean, the globalists are a bunch of stilted idiots. We just sit here and buy into their con game. It can end whenever you're ready to wake up to it. Okay, I'm, I'm ranting. I understand that. Uh, getting back to this, I mean, we have seen them try to just set up everything they can, and they are just steamrolling towards war with Iran. And I'm not saying Iran is some wonderful place and the Mullahs are great people. The point is our criminal government has overthrown them repeatedly and has bombed their country and done all this horrible stuff to them in the last 60-plus years, since 1953. And what's happening there is wrong. It's wrong. And they want a political diversion for all the crimes that the ruling class is committing here. And we do not need this war. And with more on the drumbeat for war with Iran, we're joined by veteran intelligence analyst Ray McGovern, who, of course, uh, served in the U.S. Uh, Army uh, before joining the CIA. He was uh, the chief morning briefer of Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush, and uh, he, of course, famously has confronted Rumsfeld and others about their lies about WMDs. Um, I remember, I guess it was five years ago now, time flies, uh, he, he pointed out that uh, if he was Dick Cheney, um, you know, he would stage some crisis in the Strait of Hormuz, like the Gulf of Tonkin. And then Seymour Hersh of New Yorker magazine came out about two years later after Bush had left office three years ago and said, oh, uh, by the way, I talked to White House uh, uh, high-level people. It was only Bush that stopped him. Cheney already had him painting up the uh, U.S. boats, like Iranian patrol boats, to actually stage an attack on our ships. Uh, well, now, as you know, two days ago, the U.S. sent an aircraft carrier through the Strait of Hormuz during the Iranian drill. The Iranians have said they will try to shut down the Strait of Hormuz uh, if the blockade against their oil supplies takes place. About 51 percent of their, of their uh, gasoline is imported. They have lots of oil, but not a lot of refineries. Uh, Israel, the U.S., and others are reportedly blowing up missile bases and assassinating people, launching Stuxnet attacks. So the war is already going on covertly. Uh, the question is, why is the former head of Mossad, who Netanyahu got a, a fired a year ago, come out and said it would, quote, be a catastrophe two weeks ago to attack Iran? Why are so many other people saying it uh, inside the Pentagon? Uh, but then separately, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff came out last week and said, oh, we can take care of Iran easily. They just don't know it yet. I mean, is this just more saber rattling or is it moving towards the real green light? Uh, we couldn't probably have a more informed expert on this than former CIA analyst Ray McGovern. Ray, thank you for joining us today, sir. Most welcome, Alex. Uh, wow. So, so how close to midnight are we here? Well, uh, things are pretty dicey there. There's a game of chicken going on in the Persian Gulf uh, in the Strait of Hormuz. We have U.S. Uh, aircraft carriers and other other uh, naval vessels. Uh, testing uh, the uh, the strait uh, amid uh, an exercise being conducted by the Iranian Navy. Now, <laughs> one doesn't have to be a, a student of international relations to realize uh, what potential there is for volatility here, um, what potential there is for an incident, uh, either an accident or a accidental, on purpose incident, which would set Israel and, and Iran and perhaps the United States as well uh, into armed conflict. This is very, very serious. Uh, when you quoted the chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, uh, recently on this subject, you know, we used to have a real pro. Uh, his name was Mike Mullen. And uh, he knew. <laughs> I mean, he knew, like uh, Admiral Fallon before him as head of CENTCOM, what it would mean. What do it mean to be get, getting engaged in a war with Iran? Um, and so Mullen, at every, every chance, went over to Israel and told him, look, look, don't think that we're going to automatically spring to your aid if you start a war with Iran. As a matter of fact, he did all kinds of things. Uh, one of the things that Mullen did when it was particularly dicey and he needed to summon all his strength to dissuade the Israelis from going through with it, this is 2008, you know what he did? He raised the issue of the USS Liberty, that terrible 
accidental but on purpose attack by it was a deliberate attack we know from the intercepts by the Israeli Air Force and Navy on June 8th 1967 which killed 34 American service people and wounded 174 more they tried to sink the USS Liberty knowing that it was a US ship now that has never been mentioned in diplomatic discourse with the Israelis before but but Mullen pulled it out of his quiver and said look you know I'm a naval officer I know what happened on June the 8th 1967 don't even think don't even think of perpetrating an incident in the Persian Gulf or anywhere else and think I'm going to support a retaliatory strike by the United States now the reason I mentioned Mullen is partly because his successor uh, you know, it's really hard to to describe his successor uh, because he's sort of a non-entity. Uh, he was just in place as Army Chief of Staff for a couple of months before all of a sudden uh, the fellow who was slated to become Joint Chief of Staff was, was judged to be not very malleable. He had his own, don't tell him but he had his own views on things. And he would give the president independent analysis on things like Afghanistan, okay? Now, he was shunted aside, partly because Robert Gates thought he was an unreliable person. And this fellow uh, comes in, this new chief of staff. Now, I was writing about him yesterday, and uh, his name is Dempsey. And he made his career uh, by being 20 years seized with the, uh, the issue of Iraq. Okay, uh, he was uh, active in Desert Storm, and then he was uh, he was in Iraq during the, the the war that we engaged in when Bush decided to attack Iraq. Now he was interviewed. This is relevant because what I'm about to say reflects on the kind of advice that President Obama is getting. Uh, when Dempsey was interviewed, uh, actually uh, by a Washington Post reporter, his name is Greg Jaffe. Uh, you know, he referred to his 20-year involvement with Iraq, and uh, then he acknowledged that, you know, he and the U.S. Army didn't ever quite get to understand the nature of the conflict in Iraq. And then he, he added this comment, one sentence. People say to me, says General Dempsey, now chair of our Joint Chiefs of Staff, people say to me, for God's sake, you are a two-star general. How could you say that you didn't understand? You were there 20 years. Dempsey, I don't know how I can say that, but I lived it, and I mean it. Wow. Hello. Now, this is the guy that's advising the President of the United States on what might happen in the Persian Gulf. Yeah. One of the other things that Admiral Mullen did when he saw, remember that incident in January of 2008 where there were patrol boats uh, sort of swarming and U.S. Uh, vessels in, in the Strait of Hormuz? Yes. And there was a sort of fake incident. Well, right after that, uh, Mullen proposed, you know, what's lacking here is any military-to-military -military contacts between Iran and the United States. There aren't any, of course. There aren't any contacts Yeah, let's set up a hotline, but that went over uh, like a lead balloon. Well, they, they suggested it subtly, and uh, it never got to first base. And people say, oh, the Iranians weren't interested. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a minute. It was Dick Cheney that wasn't interested. So Mullen, even though he raised that trial balloon, never got to first base. Well, our recommendation, we're, we wrote an op-ed today, um, uh, and our recommendation is simply this, that number one, you set up military communications to avoid mistakes, to avoid things that go bump in the night, uh, to avoid things that can get out of hand rather quickly, whether accidentally or on purpose. Uh, number two, what our president needs to do is make a public statement saying, look, uh, with all due respect to Israeli leaders, if you think that we will, in a knee-jerk fashion, jump to your aid if you provoke an armed conflict with Iran, think again, because we're not going to do that. Now, that, Alex, that's all it would take. If the president committed himself publicly not to be provoked into, into supporting Israel in such a conflict, Israel really would have to take heed. Now, people say, oh, the president couldn't do that. Look at the Israel lobby. They, 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 they smother him. Well, that's not my concern. 
My concern is an accidental or an on-purpose incident there in the Persian Gulf or the, and the Strait of Hormuz that would lead to this kind of conflict. We have two other recommendations for the president. One is, it's exactly what we suggested to President Bush. You know, the first, uh, the first issuance that Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, VIPS, the first issuance we made as a corporate entity was on the 5th of February 2003. And you'll remember immediately what happened that day. That was the day of Colin Powell's speech before the UN. Now, we did a four-page memorandum for the president by 5 o'clock that afternoon. Among other things, we pointed out that uh, our intelligence analysts, our former colleagues, were under great pressure to distort the intelligence. We gave, uh, we gave, we gave Colin Powell an A for delivery and a C minus for context, for context and for substance. But what I'm getting at is the final sentence we raised. I have it right here. Um, I don't have it right here, but I have it committed to memory. We said, Mr. President, we strongly urge you to widen the circle of your advisors beyond those um, who are hell-bent on starting a war for which we see no imperative and from which we believe the unintended consequences are likely to be catastrophic. Well, Ray McGovern, let me stop you right there because I've been interviewing you now for close to a decade and, and so much of what you've said has come true and it's not like you and your organization are being pretentious. You guys have advised presidents. That was your specialty was taking all the data, all the real intel, all the real research and then boiling it down for a world image of what was happening. Clearly, we probably would have had nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62 if the kind of leaders we have today were in charge then. I mean, so many of them have never been in the military. People like Richard Pearl brag at cocktail parties that, you know, he kills people and launches big wars. I mean, these are the classic little, uh, almost Kim Jong-il type, toddling, wannabe uh, dictatorial types that we're dealing with. So, so here's my question for you. From just watching this, it's gone from a stance of trying to get a war maneuvered with Iran to now more and more signals all over the media that it's a foregone conclusion, uh, strange, almost childlike comments by, by Dempsey. And, and, and again, I mean, I, it, it's scary uh, that he seems addled, uh, that they may have just put him in there because uh, you know, he'll take the fall or whatever. But then separately, you've got all these other people uh, like even the Secretary of Defense saying it's not a good idea. So it seems like there's a big split in the government publicly going on, but it looks like the Israel lobby and others in the media are going to go ahead and try to push this through and that war could basically be imminent. Now, I mean, that's kind of a smorgasbord of ideas, but uh, what are you hearing in D.C.? Well, the important thing, in my view, Alex, is what Netanyahu and Ehud Barak, the defense minister over there in Israel, what impression they have of our president. That's key. The president and Leon Panetta can go over, Panetta did go over to Israel and say, please don't start a war with Iran, please. Or well, pretty please. Or yeah. well, it wouldn't be good. No, it would be very, very bad. The question is whether they take him seriously. They don't. When Netanyahu came here, he got more standing ovations in Congress than the president got. Netanyahu is in the catbird seat. And that's why I suggest that unless Obama makes a public pronouncement saying, look, you know, war against Iran is not what we want right now. And if you start to, if you mousetrap us or try to mousetrap us into that, we're not going to do it. Unless Obama says that in a credible fashion, uh, Netanyahu is bound to conclude, in my view, that this is the time. It's an election year. The Congress is going to be in fully su full support. So will the, the uh, pro-Zionist newspapers, and uh, he'll have a free reign about it. Well, I mean, Netanyahu is, is uh, insiders have told the Washington Times in a positive way that he wants to be like Churchill. So they think once we're committed to a big war, everybody's going to line up behind it. Uh, so, so what you're saying is the president has to act like the president, but we have reports in the Washington Post, as you know, of the uh, you know Israeli operative Irgun son um, 
uh, you know, now the mayor of Chicago, Emmanuel, bosses Obama around in front of congressional delegations and cracks his knuckles in his ear. So undoubtedly, Obama's blackmailed and controlled. I mean, I know you're saying it's a good idea for him to stand up and actually serve U.S. interests, but I mean, do you see any way of having that happen when, when Obama pretty much is a teleprompter reading empty suit? Well, there were uh, some rumors recently that the doctors at George Washington University Hospital were preparing a, a, a spinal implant into the back of Obama. <laughs> but, short, but short of that, I don't see him standing up to this. And, and you know, whether I'm right or not, it's what's most important is what Netanyahu thinks. Now, if he thinks that the U.S. would have no, that the president would have no option but to fall in behind whatever Israel decides to do to Iran to start, <laughs> to start taking out their, their nuclear development facilities, uh, then uh, there's very little disincentive for, for Netanyahu to, to wait around. Uh, one of the, the proofs in the pudding, so to speak, is the fact that not only uh, Dagan, the former uh, intelligence chief of Mossad in Tel Aviv, but now the president one came. The president one came out yesterday, briefing Israeli diplomats, and said, "You know, even if Iran got one one nuclear weapon, it wouldn't be an existential threat." Well, why do people? Do, what? How do you define existential threat when we have two hundred? You know, so there's a big debate going on in Tel Aviv. And these people wouldn't be saying these things if they didn't have real fear, genuine fear, that Netanyahu and Ehud Barak, the defense minister, are going to go have, have cocked a shot. Yeah, so they're even out on a limb in Israel. So, so it's not just some monolithic, like we hear on the controlled media here, it's even more pro-war than you know, the Israeli media, that you're not pro-Israel, you hate Israel. Ron Paul's an anti-Semite because he doesn't want endless war and preemptive war. In closing, what do you think of how they're attacking Ron Paul for not not being pro-war, A, but more importantly, B, in, in just a few minutes, because I know you've got to go, sir, you got family coming over uh, uh, this evening, and we appreciate you joining us on a, a Friday night last uh, transmission we're doing of 2011. In a nutshell, and we've gone over it before in depth, but why is attacking Iran a bad idea? Why does it run from bad to worse to World War III? Well, a third of the oil in international trade goes through the Strait of Hormuz. The Iranians are not lying when they say they can easily close that. Mullen is not lying when he said, as he did two years ago, yeah, they, yeah, they could close it. He is lying when he says immediately, oh, but we can open it up. It, it's not going to be an easy task to open up the Strait of Hormuz if the Iranians do what they're threatening to do. For all manner of other things, there's Hezbollah, Hamas. There are all kinds of real terrorists, you know, not fake terrorists, but real terrorists that Iran could control and let loose. Not to mention uh, things like uh, taking pot shots at our forces in Afghanistan or even in Iraq. The big thing, you know, at the close of the year, uh, what people really need to remember, Alex, in my view, is that this has been a very, very bad year for Israel, okay? They lost Egypt, 75 million people in their southern flank who happen to feel strongly about what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians. They lost Turkey, shooting up Tur Turkish nationals on the Mavi Marmara. The Turks don't like that. And they're besieged around the rest of their periphery by people who are doing nonviolent resistance, something that the Israelis hadn't had to cope with before. At the UN, they'd taken blows. Now, what does that mean? That means they've only got one friend left, okay? And they need to show, in my view, they feel they need to show the world that, you know, this one friend, the superpower, is worth all the others and throw in five more all to put together, okay? Now, how do they do that? Well, they get involved in a, in a war with Iran, and we, as they fully expect, go in there and send off. So our, they're our, fleeing forward. And then uh, they'll show, oh, look, you know, we're still a very powerful nation because you can't look at us in, in, without looking at the United States, which is a great supporter. And that, that is a very combustible mix. Why do you think, in closing, then all these the current Mossad guy, the former one, are saying it's a, quote, catastrophe, well, obviously, in layman terms, it'll unify all the Arabs who are busy fighting with each other. Uh, it will make Israel look really bad. And then what I'm concerned about is why the West may go with this, because they want a domestic clampdown excuse with the NDAA and the military and the rest of it. 
the head of Iranian intelligence, as you said a month ago, and I went and checked it. He said it on Press TV. He did say it. He said, we're going to launch asymmetrical warfare in Tel Aviv, in New York, in D.C. I don't know. They do have these sleeper cells, but that's a bad statement by Iran because the West may do it and say they did. I mean, this is this is opening up just just a, a nightmare scenario of control. And, and, and maybe maybe the West, who's in all this political trouble domestically, maybe they want that. Yeah, it could be, you know, it could be pretty volatile here in this country. Uh, when people ask me, you know, why, why would it be that Carl Levin, Democrat from Michigan, head of the Armed Services Committee, Pat Leahy from Vermont, uh, head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, why is it that they would bless legislation that vitiates the Sixth Amendment, that vitiates the Bill of Rights, that goes back on something that those gutsy barons in England, one from King John at 1215. Huh? Magna Carta. You know? Now, why would they do that? Well, people say, well, it's easy. The Republicans, they're trying to embarrass Obama. They'll force him to either veto it and, uh, and, and you know, appear soft on terrorism or approve it and lose most of his base. So we got him. Yeah, but what about the Democrats? What about Levin? What about Leahy? You know what I think, Alex? And you can take this to the bank. I think they're afraid. They're afraid about the Occupy movement. They're afraid that they really are the 1%, and 1% against 99 is not good odds. They're afraid that the Capitol Police, the DC Police, the Secret Service will one day realize, hey, we're really part of the 99%. And when Congress is surrounded by people seeking redress of their grievances, who's to call on? I got it. We'll call on the U.S. Army. We'll reverse 133 years of tradition. We'll vitiate uh, habeas, uh, uh, the uh, policy. Comments, policy. Comments. That's long. And, and we'll, uh, we'll, the Army, uh, they'll do what they're told. They're trained to do what they're told. We tell them to shoot the uh, Rockies, they'll do them. Well, they, they'll, they'll, they'll take care of us. They'll get us home to our martini uh, dinners there in North Northwest Washington. I think that that's not too much of a stretch because I can't think of any other reason why people like Levin, who used to be a fairly progressive guy, Leahy, he used to care about the law. Now, Bill of Rights, Magna Carta, you know, hey, we got to watch ourselves because the 99% may come after us. That's a big change. This year is going to be really interesting. Wow. Alex. Yeah, desperate people do desperate things. Uh, what's the best website? We've had uh, uh, RayMcGovern.com um, up there uh, on the uh, screen, but uh, there's also a Consortium News, correct? Yes, ConsortiumNews.com is uh, where I publish. Robert Perry is the uh, editor there. He's the best investigative journalist still alive in this country in my book. I also have my own website. It's not Ray, it's RaymondMcGovern.com. Yeah, that's right. That's the one we've got up on screen. I just didn't see it there. Uh, well, you're doing amazing work, and hopefully uh, early in the new year, uh, Ray, we can get you back on to talk about what's happening domestically. But, but, but I concur with you that they are doing this because, well, look at Congress. It comes out. Most of them are insider trading, and they say it's legal, so it's legal. And they're thinking about Ceausescu. They're thinking about all the other things. And more and more, they're acting like a North Korean dictatorship, not the so-called land of the free, home of the brave. But I got to tell you, I talk to a lot of the military and I talk to a lot of police. And the, what the system is doing now is only validating what Ron Paul warned about, only validating what I've warned about and you've warned about. And now this has fueled the biggest awakening I've ever seen. I mean, when you start acting like a, a bunch of dictator thugs, that has a way of waking people up. Do you think it's going to backfire? I hope it will. Um, you know, these Occupy movements, some part of the Freedom Plaza Occupy movement in Washington. I, I come home and sleep here at night, but I'm in there often. I think they have a, a great, great chance to change the, uh, the dialogue in this country and to push forward with uh, sweeping reforms, not this or that legislation, but a, a challenge to the whole system where 1% of our country get lavish lives to lead. And then those in the margins, those in the inner city where I work, uh, those are always taking the hit. They did during Vietnam. They're doing it now during Afghanistan. And God help us, Iran. And, and there are people making big bucks over these wars. And once people, once the American people realize that 
50 cents of every dollar they pay in taxes goes to this military adventurism that there is enough money. Don't be deceived. There is enough money. It's just being wasted on these military expeditions. You take half of that. You take 25%. You take half of what the military gets. You don't have to fire any teachers, any police officers. You can fix up your towns and your, and your cities, repair the bridges. It's an amazing thing. That's right. The American, get All that, the money's been message. going to maintain this global corporate empire that's not even ours. Ray McGovern, have a uh, great uh, New Year coming up. Hope you had a... Uh, great Christmas, and we're all very pleased that uh, you've been uh, cancer-free for quite a while now. Four years now, Alex. All right. God bless. Have a great weekend. Thanks. You too. All right. Well, we certainly are ending out the year's interviews with a great researcher and a great uh, humanitarian and a great patriot out of this republic, uh, Ray McGovern. We're going to go to break and come back with the other top five down to number one stories of 2011 as we plunge into 2012. It's InfoWars Nightly News. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It was uh, between 1972 and 73, but it was still a lot of prejudice around this area. My wife was sick and I was trying to get some attention for her. Nobody came to check. They just left her there. Well, I believe I was left there because of the difference, uh, me being black and her being white. And every time I would say something to her head nurse, she would get pretty upset. And then she finally called the uh, Freeport Police Department, said I was harassing her. And I mean, I, I didn't know anything to do. Well, then Ron Paul come to my rescue. He just stepped in and went to work with my wife. And after he seen her, uh, I'd say no more than 10 minutes later, she had a stillborn boy child. And he said, as far as the bill, he would take care of everything, which he did. I never got a bill from the hospital or anything. And he was a doctor of medicine and that's what he was doing, was practicing medicine. And it didn't matter who and what and why he was doing it because he think of one human being just as much as another one. He's just a honest man. And that's something we need now in this day and time. It's a lot of politics and no honesty. When you have honesty, well, people will try to do anything to blot you out. And that's what they will try to do to him is blot him out because he will be honest and they need more like him. Click here to donate to help get James Story broadcast on television. All right, we are back. Amazing interview with Ray McGovern. Hope you get that out to everybody. And remember, it is you, the subscribers to PrisonPlanet.tv, that make this type of information possible. We're not financed by George Soros or the World Bank with, you know, stolen taxpayer money. We're financed by you, PrisonPlanet.tv subscribers. Don't forget, we've extended the 15-day free trial because it's been so popular at InfoWarsNews.com or PrisonPlanet.tv if you're watching this out there on the interwebs. Uh, then you're certainly welcome to subscribe if you believe in what we're doing, especially as the system comes in and announces that they want to censor the Internet. And, you know, that's a point I didn't put in these 10 points. Because in about three minutes before I went live on the radio today, I said, let's do a top 10 stories. And do I, Here are some of the ideas. And they kind of ran off and got it all done. But I don't think there's even Internet censorship on this list. And the... Uh, Sopapia bill and all the rest of it that openly shuts down free speech and the inventors of the internet admit it. I mean, it, it is twilight zone. Yeah, those are honorable mention stories. It's kind of like even when you're reading the Associated Press and they are, they're just calmly reporting, well, the military will now be able to have any farm animal they wish at their private dwellings to have sex with it. Uh, the NDAA has legalized bestiality. It's like, what? I mean, what is the point? I mean, it, 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 it just, it's all reached another new level. And it's only going to get crazier from this point on. 
mean, maybe David Icke's right. Maybe they are blood drinking lizards from 14 trillion years ago that time warped into our galaxy and are running gold mining operations. I mean, <laughs> maybe Emperor Palpatine is secretly in you know, a President Obama and he's just wearing like some biomechanical suit or something. I'm being sarcastic, New York Times, before you write an article about that. That was a joke. That was satire. I wasn't serious. Let's get into these other pieces uh, here. This is uh, MF Global. Numbers keep getting larger. It's over a billion, two hundred million dollars now. Corzine got caught lying. The head of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, Duffy. You just hear Thurston Howell going, "Oh, Terrence Duffy." He came out and said, "Look, I'm not going to lie here in testimony. We were in meetings. Corzine transferred the money. Nobody knows where it went." Went to London, goodbye, goodbye private bank account, brokerage account holders. Uh, it's gone and it ain't ever coming back. So uh, quite a big story because it just shows that none of these accounts of any type are safe. And uh, you look at how his, his former uh, minion, COO, was the head of the federal agency regulating him. And then there's all these other agency heads at every level that formerly worked for him. And he was formerly the head of Goldman Sachs. I mean, it just shows you this is a criminal enterprise and these people are brazen. They think they can get away with bloody murder because the average American only cares about the NFL and American Idol. But I got news for the tyrants. It doesn't matter if 50, 60% of the public needs help sucking their thumb and only cares about UT football or what the Broncos are doing. It was 5% won the war against the Redcoats. And we've got way more than 5% that know exactly who you are. And so no amount of tyranny, secret police, NDAA, admissions that they're coming after the American people is gonna put your Humpty Dumpty back together again. You just need to go ahead and come out with your hands up and give up, but I know you won't. You're gonna end up like Hitler down on that bunker with Berlin collapsing all over you. Okay, let's continue here. Uh, four is a big one, the Osama bin Laden death. I mean, I had top CIA and State Department sources a decade ago saying he was already dead of kidney failure, like Steve Pachinik and others. And I've since been contacted by some high-level government people confirming that. Uh, but we saw fake stories, fake situation room photos that were clearly staged, later admitted to be fake, burial at sea because it's Muslim tradition, not Muslim tradition. But hey, Americans will buy it. Uh, according to the establishment. Uh, they were throwing Easter bunnies and Santa Claus overboard and Keebler elves. Gotta mention those three things every show. In with the Loch Ness Monster. In, because the Loch Ness Monster lives in water, that's proof. Uh, what's the horse with the horn? Uh, unicorns were there. Flying carpets. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, the Easter Bunny's assistant, they were all there. Uh, he was a big firefight with the troops. That wasn't true. The troops get on the helicopter. It blows up and kills them. They go inside, find out nobody's there. Well, they blow up that helicopter. The rest of SEAL Team 6 talks bad about it. I predicted this. They blow them up, kill them. I've talked to a Navy SEAL who has a friend that survived SEAL Team 6. They all know it's an inside job. Uh, that all came out. So just a big fake media report. Uh, that the Easter Bunny was killed by our gracious leader, Osama bin Laden, also known as Barack H. Obama. In fact, it has more credibility to say that bin Laden actually got a face job, nose job, ear job, and is the president. Uh, continuing uh, here, the National Defense Authorization Act. It's not just abolishing the Sixth Amendment. Again, you can't overstate how incredible this is, uh, but they say they'll secretly arrest you, use the military on the streets, Ray McGovern talked about that, total martial law. Ron Paul said on the show uh, just two weeks ago, this is the establishment of martial law. That happened in 2011. So, so, so much of what we were kooks for talking about, because I went to Urban Warfare Drills and witnessed some training for this, is now just in your face. And now the talk show hosts are like, well, maybe the troops do need to secretly arrest Americans and have them disappear into a black hole. I have nothing to hide, oh yeah. But you got pension funds the bankers want. Doesn't matter how many big white New World Order genocidal rumpuses you kiss, like Richard Pearls, they want to eat you. It's like asking a big vampire, hey, I'm not against you. It's like, I don't care. I want to drink your blood. You know, it's, it'd be asking, like asking Jews in Nazi Germany, 
uh, well, I didn't do anything to you, Hitler. You know, he doesn't care, or Stalin. Like the Ukrainian farmers, he killed millions of them. He wants control. It's what they want. And all of you that sit there and bend over and kiss the wart-covered behind of the, of the devil, of, of Lucifer, um, it's not going to get you safe passage. you got to fight the system. Quite frankly, historically, you're not safe fighting evil, but you're a lot safer than trying to find the biggest boot to suck on. I mean, I'm just going to give you a little news flash here. Uh, boot licking, butt kissing does not get you anywhere, okay? Not in an end game. But you're not going to listen to some new viewers. I understand. But you will wake up later. That's why this whole transmission is really what I call the time bomb. Because if you're not listening now, you will listen later. I can almost do a Vulcan mind meld with you, like remember, so that later you do remember. You will remember. Remember how funny this is. Uh, let's continue. We have uh, Fast and Furious is number two. A huge confirmed false flag terror attack against this republic where if you actually look at the court documents, the government shipping guns all over the U.S., Indiana, Illinois, Florida, you name it, not just Mexico and Honduras, to, to, to gangs that are killing the other ga gangs that aren't laundering their money through the proper globalist banks. It also came out this year that major banks like Wachovia and Wells Fargo have laundered $370-plus billion in drug money that, that's run out of the crack house down the street. Sure it is. $376 billion. That, that, that low-level crack dealers control that. And the troops grow the opium. That's all been admitted this year, but no big deal. Uh, you got to be a little sarcastic about this. It's all pretty ridiculous. And then, and then, and then Holder's caught perjuring himself, and then CBS News admits, oh, here's the memos. They did this to blame the Second Amendment. I don't need dinosaur media trying to hold on by its little claws, trying to get some credibility to tell me this was a false flag. But confirmed false flag because CBS said so. It's like, am I on a planet? Well, CBS said so. Is this water good to drink? CBS said so. Yeah, we've got the Wayne Madsen report where he's broken down the fact that, and I already heard this, but then he talked to a confidential source that Giffords and Judge Roll were killed because they were investigating that out in uh, Arizona. And just kind of like the uh, whole mind control situation with Sirhan Sirhan, he was just drugged up. There was other shooters. And then it takes us to number one. Fukushima happened, what, 10 months ago. And uh, we told you day one there were huge explosions, total meltdowns at many of the, of the different uh, six plants there at Fukushima. It turns out five of the six did blow up and melt down, and it's still belching out radiation, but the government just raised the radiation levels and says that it's all safe now. And up in Alaska, we've got seals dying from radiation poisoning. Uh, that's all in the uh, news. And uh, it took about eight, nine months, but most of that, of the tsunami washed away houses covered with radiation from that area of Japan of now hitting the West Coast, and people are reportedly getting radiation sickness. Kids are dying and others uh, in um, dying in the schoolyards, dropping dead from heart attacks from radiation, damaging their heart muscle. Uh, we've had top scientists talking about how it infects the heart with the, with the chemicals and, and the radiation and finally kills them. All that's going on, but the trendy media waves a magic trendy wand. And why I call it a trendy wand is, it, it just if it's an establishment person reading off a teleprompter with their little outfit done just right, shaking, you know, like a starving chihuahua, like one of the info babes on, on Fox News who's anorexic but wants to look good for the camera. Um, you know, I mean, if they say radiation is good for you, yeah, half of Americans would drink it down. But the good news is the world isn't run by cattle. It's not run by people who don't care. It's not run by people who will buy any lie they're told. It's run by people that get involved. And that means the evil people that get involved and the good people. And it's always a contest between minorities on both ends of the spectrum. The good and the bad. Who is going to win this fight? Well, that's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News, the last of the year. And we will see you back here coming up next Monday, 2012. I guess that'll be the second day of 2012. January 2nd, 2012. The vaunted year of insanity straight ahead. If you're not on InfoWars, PrisonPlanet.tv subscriber. Find out more at PrisonPlanet.tv. I'm Alex Jones, signing off. Great job to the subscribers and great job to the crew.